Series, and I am so thrilled to see so few faces that I recognize. This really <laughs> awesome. uh, just to give you a, a little um, intro to what you've signed up for. Uh, at InSeries, for each production we do, uh, we're, we're, we're a small opera theater company, we do about six productions a year, and for each of those we do something called a director's salon. And it's a format we've been playing with over the last couple of years. Last year, uh, they took the form of panels of experts from diverse fields, so we would mix a, a dramaturg with a physicist, with a neuroscientist, and talk about the themes of a production and, and sort of try to find the common ground in the work we do. And we would try to do those at interesting spaces around the city. This year, uh, the format's been a little bit more organic. We started uh, for our production of Butterfly, we did two panels, one on race in opera and one on gender in opera. Uh, then we did a production that was tied to The Tempest at the same time another theater company in town was doing The Tempest. So we had a joint salon talking about different ways to approach Shakespeare. And this one is completely new. We've never done a salon come dance off. So, uh, uh, and one, one of the things that means is that, uh, that we have a little less time for the, for the talkie talkie so that we have enough time um, to explore the actual moving and, and physicality of it. And usually I start these uh, salons by reading uh, bios of, of the panel and then asking the panel uh, to talk about why they, why X. So in my case, why opera, in Alex's case, uh, why, why tango, dancing tango. And in, in Henny and Max's case, why playing tango? I know one of those two things has to be cut. And I think, I'm going to take a leap of faith, I think that hearing the panel talk is a little more interesting than hear me read bios. So I'm going to start, um, start with, this, uh, with, with that approach, with asking, uh, starting with Emily, to sort of why, why they ended up in the, in the, the area of, of work that they're in. And maybe also, since I'm not doing an introduction, to give just a small uh, intro to, to who they are, where they're from, what their what their uh, involvement in the in the project is, or or outside the project. Hello, my name is Emily Baltzer. I am music directing Carmen this year, and um, I got into musical theater about ten years ago, and I haven't looked back. I think storytelling through music is one of the most wonderful ways that we can tell stories, and opera is kind of the, the height of that. Um, yeah, I guess why, why I'm in opera and who I am. That's it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexandra Russell, Alex for short. And I've been dancing tango socially since 2006. I got into it because I was looking for some way to get off the couch. And as soon as I started, I discovered a whole- and here you are on the couch. On the couch. <laughs> <laughs> full, full circle. And in addition to, um, to learning and enjoying the dance, I um, expanded my interest to teaching and writing about the tango. I've had a couple of articles published in the Washington Post about events. And then um, in 2013, I decided to study the history, which is a little mysterious since it started in, uh, on the wrong side of the tracks in the slums of Buenos Aires over 100 years ago. And I took a graduate level course with an Argentine university online and learned so many interesting things. So that's why I'm here to share some of that. Um, I have a very varied career. Mostly I've been in healthcare and variety of functions and for 15 years. I'm a nurse anesthetist. But um, I've been playing piano since I was little and when I finished my degree in anesthesia I wanted to play more and by accident I found a local tango community orchestra. It's called now what? Do you see tango orchestra? Okay. Um, it was something else at the time. And um, because of that orchestra, I got into bandoneon, this instrument. And then when I fet, met my uh, teacher, Santiago Segret, it changed everything. I just came back from Buenos Aires a few weeks ago. I was there for almost a year, playing with different orchestras and universities in the area. Um, and I'm just very, well, Max and I are very involved in trying to push live time of music in the United States, which is kind of non-existent. Um, playing bandoneon in the United States is also almost non-existent. It's a gendered instrument. I don't know if you knew that. It's associated with masculinity in men. I, um, I'm also doing my master's in ethnomusicology at University of Maryland. And I also did a variety of looking up different, um, I have a different list 
In the United States, at varying levels, there's only maybe 80 Birmingham players. Out of those 80, there are maybe 14 women. In all of the world, there might be 200 women. Um, so the fact that you even found one in your city is very, it's very bizarre. <laughs> um, so yeah. My name is Max. Um, I play the cello. And I fell into tango about almost exactly 10 years ago when I was in school. I'd always known about Piazzolla, and um, I was just really in the right place at the right time to fall in some with uh, some cool musicians at the time in Indiana. And I started dancing at the same, the same time because they looked at me as a little kid from Wisconsin, and they were all really not from Wisconsin and about 10 years older than I was. <laughs> And uh, they sent me to start dancing, uh, which I didn't fight at all. It was great. It was wonderful. Um, and it's been sort of slowly taken over my life uh, since then. Here in D.C., I've had a, used to be a quartet and then a quintet, and we're calling it an orchestra these days because we want to play with as many people as, as we can. Uh, Di Capo Tango uh, Orchestra. And uh, on the Facebook, yes. <laughs> and uh, I have a radio show as well in Tacoma Park, which um, Tacoma Radio. It's a lot of fun. You can also listen to that online. I do that with Phil, who is the dance teacher who will be here in a moment. Um, and Tango, for me, we actually have a series on the radio show called Why Tango, but I've carefully avoided answering <laughs> where we ask people how, how they got involved and why, why they, they continue to do it. Um, it's not the, the world of of um, sort of sly fishnets that Hollywood would want you to believe. It's really, um, it's a it's a culture with many different parts going going back over a hundred years. And through that time, there's been a sort of a participatory core. When you know, in classical music, we're always wondering how to get more people involved in in productions and things. And here's tango where. Um, there's there's music and there are people dancing and interacting with each other all in that same moment and that's been happening for over a hundred years and then at the same time out of that in the different uh, disciplines the music and the dance and the poetry and the fashion there have been sort of virtuosic parts that come out of it and develop into really different um, and exciting uh, artistic almost genres but all surrounding that sort of core of everyone being in a moment at the same time so uh, so I'm, I'm going to get us started by just saying a little bit about the Opera Carmen um, to get us all on the same page and explain what we're doing. Actually, this project started because uh, we, we were looking at doing an opera by uh, Piazzolla called Maria de Buenos Aires. Um, what? <laughs> uh, which, which, which in the end I felt, I, I felt wasn't, wasn't right for this season and that we couldn't, we, we couldn't do uh, a, a good enough job of presenting it. Um, uh, being an opera company and not a dance company, and it's, it's a very dance heavy piece. Uh, and, but the idea of doing something with tango stuck, and um, all of a sudden the light bulb went on for Carmen. Now, Carmen is, a, is an opera by Bizet. It's written in, I think, 1875. Bizet had had a stunning career as a student at the Paris Conservatory, and then that career fizzled and went nowhere. Uh, he, he run the, the, the Prix de Rome. Uh, went to Rome, and when he got back, he had, he had failure after failure after failure. Uh, he had an, a, a, an early failure with a one-act opera called Dr. Maracla, which was written for uh, the opera Comique. Um, then uh, the Pearl Fishers, which of course is now recognized at least for the duet, uh, if not if not as a, a great piece, I love the Pearl Fishers. It was at the time uh, a big flop. Uh, the only critic, this is uh, interesting to music nerds like me, the only critic that, that appreciated uh, Pearl Fishers and, and loved it was actually Berlioz, who we just did L'Enfance de Cris, so we're in, in a Berlioz mode. Um, then Bizet takes about 10 years off and doesn't write any opera, and then he writes Carmen. Um, Carmen, the, the, the source for Carmen was his idea to, to, to write an opera based on the novel. Uh, it's a small novella by Prosper Merimé. We think that uh, Bizet was studying Merimé when he was in Rome, and the idea to do something with it stuck in his head. Uh, the book is almost a travelogue. It's the author's um, experiences traveling in Andalusia uh, and in the Basque country. And he meets there in a prison a soldier who tells him the story of having killed not one, not two, not three, not four, five people. 
Um, so really a serial killer. It's a very dark play. Um, and he meets this guy who blames having turned into a serial killer on having fallen in love with the gypsy Carmen. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's a shocking subject to decide to put on the stage in, in Paris. And the, the two librettists um, who collaborated on Carmen added some things to make it better. So they added the character of Michaela because they felt like there needed to be some woman in the piece who was redeemable, quote. Uh, and they made the role of Escamillo, the bullfighter, a much bigger, though equally as vapid, role. Um, and, and also then Bizet was sort of forced to write opera comic music. So the music of um, the Sagadilla or the Habanera that we all know, or the Toreador song, these are things that Bizet actually hated about the piece. He liked, he liked the fourth act. He liked that part of the music, which is almost like Italian verismo. That's really hard hitting. Um, but I think what makes, what makes Carmen an amazing piece is that it has both. It's what holds us and grabs us. Um, so even though he didn't appreciate that part of the music, I, I think the piece wouldn't be as successful without those bits. Um, the most famous piece from Carmen, the piece that we all know, in fact, I think it's the very first piece I ever, I, I, I can remember um, seeing on the opera stage, uh, is of course the Habanera, um, which you hear those four notes and you know exactly what, what piece it is and, and what the next part of the line is. Um, it's interesting that we know this piece by just the, the, the form, the rhythmic form, Habanera. Of course, the, that's not the text to the piece. Um, and now when people hear the term Habanera, they automatically think of that piece of music. Uh, it ha the Habanera as a form has a really interesting journey. Um, uh, habanera means of, of Havana, from Havana. Uh, but actually, the dance form starts uh, in the French court in the 18th century. Uh, and Fran the French court being the dominant court in Europe, it was popularized then to the Spanish court. And then through, uh, through colonialism, it traveled from the old world to the new world, um, um, most stunningly in Cuba, where it combined with, um, with two uh, African um, rhythmic principles. One is tresillo, which is, if you think of a, a, a bar that has eight, um, is separated to eight beats, it would be three plus three plus two. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. And then it mixes um, with something called backbeat, which, which is syncopating um, what in normal bar would be the rest, the offbeat. Actually, in the habanera, it actually is the on beats. Um, so I can't hold them. Uh, so if, if one hand is snapping the tercio, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, and the other one's doing the other one. Oh, wow. Well done. And that's just <laughs> 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 Um I, and that's that's where the that rhythm comes from. It gets super popular in Cuba, and then we always think of culture as coming from the colonizer to the colonized. But of course, in 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 fact, uh, culture moves both ways, and it moved back from Cuba to Spain. It becomes <laughs> it becomes incredibly popular in Spain, so much so that the rest of Europe assumes it is Spanish, and it becomes the quintessential Spanish music for the rest of Spain, not realizing that it's not actually a Spanish music. Um, it then returns to France. And people like um, Jules Massenet, when he writes his opera El Cid, he has to include a habanero. Ravel had to include a habanero when he, when he writes the pictures of Spain. Sanson did the same thing. And of course, uh, Bizet, when writing Carmen, had to include a habanero. Bizet had heard it. He had, he'd heard this song. He thought it was a folk song. So he notated it down and introduces it in the opera. Uh, as the habanera, as wholly original. And then someone pointed out to him that it wasn't actually a folk song. It, it, it had a composer, and Berlioz had to correct the score and, and admit that actually the, the bulk of the melodic material of the habanera is, is by, a, by a Spanish composer. Uh, I think this is really beautiful how it travels from France to Spain, to the New World, back to Spain, and back to France. Um, and I, it's also interesting. It also went to Argentina. Yeah. But the, how did it, South America? I'm sure you guys will tell us how it traveled south from, from, from Cuba. You know, uh, people have done have looked at a lot of sheet music published in the late 1800s uh, of, through Latin America, from um, Argentina, Chile, all the way up to uh, New Orleans, and you find this rhythm everywhere. And that was like how you know popular music was consumed at that time was sort of you know piano kinds of sheet music, and you can find this rhythm 
everywhere under a, a bunch of different names. And of course, in different places, it's personalized in different ways. You know, Tango personalizes it quite a bit and it evolves within parts of Tango. Um, but it, it's, been, it's really interesting watching how it is really just everywhere in the below New Orleans. It becomes yeah. ubiquitous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention before I shut up and let the experts talk. Um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, uh, the, the um, philosopher, writes a book in the 1860s, I think, called uh, the, the Birth of Tragedy. And the second part of it is basically an ode to Wagner. And, and he's quite the sycophant to Wagner. And then about 10 years later, he writes a more famous book called The Case of Wagner, uh, where he uh, refutes everything he said before, apologizes for it, <laughs> says he was absolutely wrong. Um, and, and actually what he's doing in there is warning against a sort of plague of nihilism that was spreading in Europe and anti-Semitism uh, anti and xenophobia. Uh, and, but he opens the essay by saying, last night I heard Bizet's masterpiece, Carmen, for the 20th time. Um, and I never thought I would have such patience, but this is a music that is clean. It's a music that makes me a better person. It makes me a better philosopher. It makes me a better listener. And he goes further to say it's a music that not only makes me better as an individual, but makes my race better, that makes us better as, as human beings. I think, I'm going to tell myself, that... Um, that <laughs> What he's, what he's getting at is that this is a music that is, is messily full of influences from all over the world. It is the opposite of xenophobic music. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what he's grasping at. This is a music that makes us better because it is of all of us. Um, and and, and the, last, the last thing I'll say, uh, if, if any of you came and, and you're so many new faces, I don't think many of you did, but we did a production this year called Stormy Weather, which is a retelling of the Tempest from the perspective of the, the African enslaved characters in the piece. And we used the music of Billie Holiday, but there was also some other music in it. And, and there was a moment in the show when um, uh, uh, Caliban, who's the, the son of Sycorax, tries to, to, to console her by, getting, by chanting her name to an African rhythm. Our drummer, uh, Jabari Exum, um, taught a, 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 a historic rhythm um, and on stage, he would have the cast start doing the, the even beat, and the other half start doing the triseo. We had I had no idea that there was this connection to habanero when we did that. Um, but I think it's an amazing thing that ties um, our season together between these these two pieces that would otherwise seem disparate. We're gonna um, show you a bit of the habanero, but first, because um, Alex and I emailed a bit about it, um, I, I thought I might ask you, Alex, to talk about the connection between habanero and tango rather than habanero and, and opera. Sure. So as Kimi and Max mentioned, um, the habanero from Spain traveled not only to Europe, but to Argentina and throughout Latin America. And there was a constant back and forth, really, of these different genres. And in the, in the very early history of the tango, we know that the habanero was one of the most popular dances at the time in the eight, we're talking about the 1880s. So there was the habanera, there was also the milonga, the, which at the time is known as a, as a country rhythm. It was something that the gauchos, the cattle herders and the cowboys in Argentina would, would, uh, would play that evolved from folk music in general. We know that um, even though there's this idea that the tango started with men dancing with men in brothels, in fact, people in Argentina and the countries that they immigrated from, Southern Europe, also Eastern and Northern Europe, had a tradition of couples dancing together, dancing folk dances. And a lot of those informed the music of Argentina, including the milonga. And even though it was a country dance, the gauchos would drive the cattle all the way to the city, to Buenos Aires. And where did they stay? They stayed in the working class neighborhoods along with the stevedores and the seamstresses and the other working class people. And they brought their guitars and their singing traditions. And what were people dancing? They were dancing the habanera, they had the milonga, uh, they also had um, the Andalusian tango, which started out um, 
without a dance, but involved the dance with the couple dancing separately. Um, and so along with the waltz, which was extremely popular in the um, mid to late 1800s, um, some of the other Eastern European dances as well, the mazurka, very popular during that period. So those were the habanero was just one of the main influences in the evolution of the tango, along with a less well-known influence, which was the afro argentine So um, just like jazz evolved in New Orleans from European and African contributions, as well as um, in Cuba, the habanera, also from Spanish and um, African elements, in Argentina, there was a, at the time, you know, again, 1880s, around there, 70s, 80s, a large Afro-Argentine contingent, and they had their drumming traditions with the types of rhythms that you demonstrated to them. And they had their dances that were most popular in the Mardi Gras type, the carnival processions. And as the tango evolved, the local dancers started adding elements of the African dance. And that's one among many reasons why it was considered so scandalous because there, there was some hip shaking involved. And, um, and that sort of element. So um, to me, that's the, the obvious connection with the what's, the. what's the distinction between, is it just a rhythm that's used in tango? Is it one of many rhythms used in tango? It, it wasn't, my understanding of what is that it's, it was a heavy influence and it's the closest musically and rhythmically to the tango. Can I add one tiny little extra detail to that, which is kind of interesting? Um, a friend of mine in grad school who had actually been in Cuba, been in Cuba and, and sort of was working to be the Santeria uh, priest. Um, there, he his dissertation was tracing the three three two rhythm uh, through Africa and back to Baghdad in the the, the eight hundreds. Um, so you can, really? yeah, you can really trace this really compelling rhythm sort of all over the place. Habanera was used in the milonga, milonga cantera. So talking about the gauchos, the cowboys, and the countryside, it started there. As they went to the city, it became the milonga ciudadana. These are names people are putting now to make sense of everything that happened. They didn't call it that. So that's what people call it now. So um, that was in more like the countryside type of Milonga. Origins of tango are very complex and no one really knows what happened. Some, some of them say it's European influence. Uh, others say it's like heavy African influence. I think I'm with you, it's just one mix. Over time, this rhythm went away and it became this. Are you deep? And so essentially, there's three genres of tango there's a waltz and a tango and a milonga. This became modern day milonga. Milonga campera is still played very actively, um, it hasn't gone away. Um, there's a lot of pieces that will use both. Yeah. So, so we're very lucky at, in the series to have um, Kara Gonzalez, who Schaefer. is. Oh gosh, she got married last Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Kara Schaefer, uh, who, who is our marketing and outreach coordinator and is also a fabulous singer, and she is going to be performing the role of Carmen. Under the name of Kara Schaefer with Gonzalez in parentheses. Schaefer with Gonzalez in parentheses. There you go. Yeah. 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 Et si bien avec la fête 
c'est lui qu'on vient de briser. Rien n'est fait de la surprise, mais pas le bien l'autre se tire. Et c'est l'autre que je préfère, il n'a rien dit, mais il me plaît. centuries or so and uh, it's really high tech because it has a stick that goes from the top to the bottom called the sound post which makes it way louder than a guitar because the whole instrument vibrates and it's way less interesting at the moment than a bandoneon so I'm gonna let her <laughs> uh, everyone asked me what the bandoneon is and they all think it's an accordion I say yes because it's the closest thing I can think of because it, it works under a bellows system air goes in it, there's reeds inside of it. I hit a button, air goes in, sound comes out. And an accordion works the same way. That's essentially all it has in common. So, um, the difference is between an accordion is longer and it's shorter. And it can't do a lot of the, in Spanish, called yetes, or tricks. So, 
so it's very hard for an accordion to do this. For those who are in the back, I'm, I'm using my, my heel. Tango is the only popular dance so far that doesn't use percussion for people to dance. So all of the instruments take the role of the percussion. Um, and so the bandoneon developed when we started doing, how do we get people to move without percussive instruments? So the foot is used a lot. This is called a marcato. It's a very basic rhythm. Another one is you'll hear in the next song. And in my left hand, I'm thinking about the rock It doesn't help that all the keys are out of order. Right. So I think it has to do with I think it has to do with learning curve. Like a guitar, you learn a couple of chords on guitar and you can play in a band. Bandoneon, like it's a good year of sounding terrible before you can do anything. And they're in a different order when you breathe in and out. Right. So here for those who see, so the there's no reason to the keyboard system. Can you play us a C major scale yeah, so we can okay. see your fingers? Do you want to play a whole piece? Do you want to play a whole piece? Is that time? I want you to play a whole piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. It was it was uh, developed in Germany around the same time as the saxophone, actually, in the eight, yeah eighteen sixties, I think. Thank 
So our our production of Carmen tries to use the, um, the 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 show business of some of the music to make the piece more cruel. So in the same way, the musical cabaret actually uh, makes the the events of the Weimar Republic pre pre um, Nazi Germany more acute by by making the audience laugh and then and then have to have to address that in themselves. This piece sets Carmen as a cabaret experience with the audience at tables with Carmen as a cabaret performer and um, and some body humor, uh, to say the least, uh, that, that then tries to implicate the audience in the, um, the, the really awful homicidal misogynistic piece that, that it is. And in that way to, to, to get at what's wrong underneath it. The other thing it does uh, is so, so a major influence of mine in creating the piece was uh, was film noir, but also the Spanish response to, to film noir, so neo noir, uh, which which is most most wide known in the films of Pedro uh, Almodovar, um, and in particular the inspiration for this piece was a film called Mala Educación, uh, which is about um, about a lot of things, but a central character is a uh, a trans woman um, who uh, lives in a, a very difficult society um, and fights tooth and nail just to have her own identity even unto death. And in a, in a way, this reminded me very much of Carmen's journey. Uh, and our piece uh, explores um, violence against trans women. It also explores just gender as an expanded um, understanding. Uh, and so I wondered if, Alex, if you could speak about um, that mystique in tango, which I, which I know nothing else, so I'm prepared for you to tell me that I'm totally making this up. But this understanding of tango, not not as a queer phenomenon necessarily, but as a place that has um, uh, expanded gender roles or or ex expanded approach to gen gender. Well, historically, Argentine society uh, was 
very rigid and traditional. And that expressed itself in the tango, which reflects the social and political development of the country. And in recent years, is that what you're talking about? Just to, I mean, because you referred earlier to the, the sort of origin story that we all have in our head of it being men who dance together, but sort of right. to what to what extent is that true, and then how does it develop through, and, and where is it now? <laughs> okay, so traditionally, even though historian, Argentine historians dispute the claim that the tango was born in brothels, it was certainly danced there. It was in, originally, it was danced wherever there were parties. And in the um, late 1800s, the Argentine government opened up the country to mass immigration. And unlike immigration, for example, to the US, which was more families, immigration to Argentina was had a majority of men. So there were a lot of unpartnered men. And there have been um, census studies done by Argentine historians that demonstrate that. that so by the late 1800s, we had 125,000 unpartnered men in the city. So obviously, that led to an explosion of prostitution. So that was part of it. And men, um, are, the historians also recognize that men would dance with men, but often out of necessity rather than preference, especially considering the fact that if you imagine life in the late 1800s for poor working class people, you could not even afford the tram fare to a downtown dance hall, the dance school if there had even been one let alone the class. So people taught themselves. You learned, if you were a man, you learned from your brothers and your cousins and your dad and your uncle and your grandpa and your friends. And, and same with, um, with women, with women and the practice of the dance hall. And also, it was considered improper for, for men to dance, for anyone to dance in public in the streets. And how do we know this? Because in the early 1900s, the city of Buenos Aires banned dancing by in the streets. Kevin Bacon. Sorry? Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Who does it? So some of the, the um, but in the streets was also where people would hear tango. So one of the ways, again, imagine before radio, before recording, let alone television or film, uh, music, including the tango, was spread through sheet music, as, as Max mentioned, but also through organ grinders. And they were in the streets, and they learned their music from the sheet music they would copy. And so you can imagine people on their Sunday afternoon, their one free day, and they're strolling in downtown Buenos Aires, and they hear an organ grinder, and there's some guys, and they're, they really want to dance, but you know, no, no, none of the ladies in the fair rounds are, are going to dance with them. So they dance with each other, and they get arrested because it was illegal. Now, also, um, in this rigid, very traditionalist society, homosexuality was illegal. So it's not that it didn't exist, but it was underground. And later in the century, towards the late 1800s, you start to see um, homosexuality appearing in a more positive light in community theater. So there's a, there was a form in addition to the, the zarzuela, the Spanish form that was popular. It's basically a community theater form, so something that average people could afford and could go to. And the plays that were imported from Spain often had to be tweaked for the Argentine audiences, because, for example, a seguiria performance for you know, people in, in the Boca neighborhood of <coughs> Buenos Aires wouldn't have the same impact as a Malonga or even a Habanera or something that and Argentine uh, playwrights started writing their own pieces with elements of the tango and also of this underworld um, of, of homosexuality. 
Now, fast forward several decades to um, contemporary Argentina, there's been um, huge leaps in uh, legislation driven by social movements. So for instance, Argentina did legalize same-sex marriage uh, <coughs> less than that. And there's also been um, very active movements for women's rights, especially against domestic violence and, and for reproductive rights. A bill was considered in their Congress a couple of years, a year or so ago. It didn't pass, but the fact that it was even considered was a huge step. And this, this uh, new awareness of the issues has, has overflown into tango dance halls. And so whereas traditionally men dance with women, men are the ones who ask the women to dance, and now the rules have been opening up so that in some places, um, we were just there, there are some venues that say, uh, well, anyone can ask anyone to dance. And in fact, you can dance whichever way you want. Ladies can lead, men can follow. And already for some years now, there have been um, weird tango dance halls where everyone is welcome, but it's friendlier to same-sex couples who want to dance together. Whereas, and I've traveled to Buenos Aires several times and been to many of the traditional milongas, so you rarely can ever, ever see same-sex couples. So if you, if you do want to have a more open approach, you have to go to, to specific ones that are, that are friendlier. So there's definitely an evolution, which is really interesting and exciting to see. A book I highly recommend was written by Mercedes Vista. She's an ethnomusicologist in Argentina. Uh, in 2017, she published her book, Queer Tango in Buenos Aires. And her book, what she said, it's very interesting. 2001, uh, the market in Argentina plummeted. The only industry that saw uh, a profit in GDP was the tango tourist industry. And what's interesting about what she argues is that a lot of people from the United States and Europe went to um, Buenos Aires because it was cheaper, and a lot of them were from the LGBTQ community. Because in Europe and the United States, they were used to dancing same gender couples. They went to Milongas where that was not welcome. And so there's two organizers who still exist who are very important in the queer tango movement in Buenos Aires, who saw that need and fulfilled that need by providing milongas. Through those interactions, they maintain contact with these organizers in Europe and the United States. And in talking to these organizers in the United States, that um, the first queer tango festival started in Buenos Aires in around 2010. The government subsidized this because they needed money, not because they were trying to promote LGBTQ rights, but it caused an impetus. So now, through what's very, she said that these cities, the queer tango community is not connected by countries, but by cities. Um, and Buenos Aires, now there are Malongas that a year ago, when I was there over two years ago, I would have never seen same gender dancing. And now it would be weird not to see it. It's becoming very, very, it's becoming more normalized. Like, well, why not? Why shouldn't I be able to dance with whoever I want? Versus five years ago, that was not seen. Um, it's very interesting. Cause I actually wrote a paper on this. So it's very interesting <laughs> that this city, this when I was researching all of this, uh, DC was not part of this connection of queer tango community. And through interviews, I, DC, um, when did I do this? Four years ago? Uh, in DC, for, it has one of the largest tenant communities in the United States. And at that time, there were only three people of the LGBTQ community that we knew of. In an entire, I was like, that's insane. And I asked why, 
why they thought that was, and it's because the stereotype, this idea that tango dancing is for the man is the leader, the woman is the follower, is so ingrained. And it was Liz Sabatiuk, Liz who, I, who I talked to about this. She was thinking about doing class, and I was like, you should do it. She did. And now they have like this whole like um, class for um, learning both roles, the male and the follower, and now they're becoming part of the community, which for me is very exciting. I'm like, oh wow. Perfect segue. <laughs> yes, uh, I just wanted to add that uh, Liz organized these uh, these classes, the queer tango classes through Tango Mercurio, um, which I am a board member. And we have a queer tango initiation session coming up on uh, February 3rd. It's very good. If anyone is interested in learning it from both sides. Um, I, uh, so I'm going to try to segue into, into our next performance. Okay. Um, by asking, um, so, so so for me, I see a lot of ties between Carmen as the opera and tango. And for me, what we've done is organic. And obviously, part of what I'm trying to do today is convince you that, that I'm, I'm not nuts. Um, <laughs> what, another element is that Carmen is very much about um, a, a woman struggling to, to have her, to be uncompromising in her personal identity in a in spheres uh, that don't don't accept that, so in totally male spheres, the soldiers in the beginning, the smugglers, um, and then of course maybe most um, notably in 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 the world of the matador and the bullfight, and that incredible um, masculinity, toxic masculinity that oozes from that. Um, and I'm wondering, and again, I, tell me if I've just read bad sources. Um, I, I read about uh, a lot of the mythology or fetishization in tango having to do with the image of the fallen woman and the woman who is um, has gone with a new lover and has been murdered by an ex-lover and this sort of uh, approach femininity. I wondered if you could maybe address that and then um, me, if you had any thoughts of like, what was the experience of being uh, a, a woman in such a male-dominated, yeah, oh, studying in, in, in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> so in its um, early um, stages, the tango, as I mentioned, was a party music, and so the lyrics tended to be playful, uh, often with double entendres, even some rude lyrics. And towards the, there's a turning point in 1917 when a young singer named Carlos Gardel recorded his first um, his, his first song, Minote Triste, My Sadness. And suddenly, at that point, the lyrics turned more introspective. And some common themes emerged that would continue for some decades. Since it was a music that had a huge contribution from immigrants, the sense of nostalgia and loss, missing family, loneliness, those were constant themes. And whereas, as far as women, um, the role of women goes, whereas in the, in the earlier tangos, most of the references to women were on the part of very self-assured, um, characters such as there's a song called La Morocha, the brunette, the dark haired woman who's not afraid to proclaim her love of the Argentine man with passion, not some, you know, virginal fiance, but um, who loves him with ardor. Suddenly, or, or rather later, with this new, this new phase that corresponded to the beginning of the recording industry when the songs could be more widely um, disseminated. And then there's this inward looking trend. And the um, professor, Gustavo Barrera, who I studied with, he, he notes that there evolved a dichotomy in, in, in the approach to women. So you have the fallen woman, the one who's out there for fun, but who will, you know, eventually abandon you, poor guy, compared with 
the neighborhood girl who's poor, but she's pure and pure hearted. And if you stray from home, from the neighborhood, in other words, poverty is noble and money is terrible and will only lead to the downfall. So that's, those were some of the- Carmen and the Exactly. exactly. So. <laughs> hard question. I thought to put a lot of comments. Look, nowadays it's rare to find the person who's going to say that a, that a woman will never be good at other men. Which Piotola said himself. But he said that there's no way a woman can ever be good at other men because she's not physically strong enough. That kind of like blatant misogyny or like xenophobia, racism, all of the ills of society in most places, it isn't going to be in your face. But it's there, let's be honest. So you see it in, in very like small things. Like for example, I have very small hands. I'm a very small person. And so for me to, to reach the extremes of the instrument is very difficult. And so something with technique, you should, you should never leave your hand off of the, the, the estapo, your heel. But for me to reach here, I have to let it go. And so it makes my sound weaker. It just does. Now, I had someone, again, this did not come from a place of badness or a place of like, this is a horrible person. It's the, it's the prejudices that all of us have and we don't realize we have and we don't want to admit to ourselves that we have them. So his solution, his solution to me was, well, um, he's like, well, I was like, can't let your hand off of the top. I'm like, I know, but I can't do it. And he was like, well, you just need to figure it out. He's like, he's like, because the instrument is too big for you. <laughs> That's what I thought. I said nothing. Well, thank you. Another teacher. Because people ask me, why did I have to go to Buenos Aires to get teachers? It's because of what happens here. So that was one person here. Another person, I was trying to learn the keyboard system, and he was like, Oh, well, he's like, that, that was so stupid. It, it literally made me feel as if my method of learning was irrelevant and stupid. And he told other students that I was studying with a crazy person. And blah, blah, blah. These are like the, the small things that happen all the time to each and every one of us who have to deal with these absurdities, whatever, whatever those absurdities are, they all happen. Um, and I experienced them. Um, it's very, so under the surface and so systemized that me just being here fights against that. And like I, I'm glad that panels like this exist to address these things. In that usually no misogyny is not like in your face or any kind of prejudice against any kind of minority. Um, it's these small things that try to keep you down. It is getting better. I do think so, but I remember there's this there's this uh, bandoneon player Ava Wolf. She's in her 40s now, and I can't imagine what life must have been like for her 20 years ago playing bandoneon. It's much easier for me, and everyone tells me they don't like her sound, and I'm like, why don't you like her sound? I don't know. They can't tell me. You could you give a recording of her playing. They don't. I don't tell them it's her. Oh, it's great. But you put her face, it's not as good. I think something that's, that's interesting about tango is with its long history of extraordinarily uh, both codified and unwritten uh, structures and layers of, of cultural misogyny and things. And the combination of, uh, there are sort of, to me, when I'm talking about tango, kind of two faces. There's what happens within the tango community and how people who are who, who participated in it um, know how it works. And then there's the, the sort of public uh, perception of tango, which is quite different and full of a different kind of mystique and things. And um, in both of those places, because of the history and the work that's been done, it's a, it's a really interesting place to have this discussion because you can name a lot of things that have been codified in that time. And it's also a place where if you want to, you can 
use the the myths and the mystique to make certain statements, um, which I think is what you're doing a lot with this production, um, which uh, are, are, are call on that that sort of perception and things to to turn that around and really look at, at how hard that can be uh, in different places. Um, Carmen, of course, has one of the, well, to use Henry's words, one of the great uh, absurdities uh, and great misogynists in the opera canon, uh, which is, of course, Escamillo. Uh, and we're very lucky to have uh, Alex Albuquerque, who is not absurd or, or a misogynist, just plays one on TV. Uh, uh, and while Alex is going to come up here, because after this, I want us to be able to get to the dance itself, um, I just want to ask Emily, because Emily's from my world, um, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, which, which is a uh, tango neophyte. Uh, at that. So, so I just wanted to ask Emily about her experience of rehearsing this piece and trying to find the tango elements in it and then also adding in Max and Hayden. Um, I think the most challenging thing for me has been letting go a lot of opera conventions and letting tango conventions take over. Um, and a lot of that is timing and certain things. But it, yeah, it's been great, and Max has been very helpful being in the rehearsals and incorporating pieces slowly. Um, yeah. <laughs> part, part, part of this has been giving ourselves um, permission to, to not approach the music the way it's supposed to be done. And, to, and that's, that's especially true vocally, perhaps, uh, to sing it in a, di a different way. Um, uh, and, and also to free ourselves up musically yeah. to, to do the things that we know our colleagues will gasp at and to delight in the idea of them gasping at. <laughs> so, so not, can, I make a, can I make a tiny comment about that? Not to keep talking. We'll get to the music really soon. Uh, so we, we've talked a lot about the bum, ba -dum, bum, bum idea, which is only really in, in tango of the last 80, 90 years, a small bit of what tango is. There's this other rhythm called playing in four, uh, which we do a lot. You like, Three, one, two, three, four, yeah. Which, which, and um, so uh, actually some of the most tangifying parts we've done in this are in some of those sections where we're really able to to play and and have fun. We have, she mentioned the syncopa earlier and, and playing, playing in four. And uh, this particular piece that we're about to play, I think you'll see a lot of that uh, later. Shall we do it? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. 
today in this rainy day. We really appreciate it. And I hope that uh, I will see all of you in any of our performances coming up. But now, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I'm here today, the reason why God put me on this earth, ladies and gentlemen, the second verse. <laughs> Shoes today. Uh, feel free to watch a bit and then to enjoy the music when uh, when when we get going. Well, I didn't know I was going to be making a speech. Oh, you don't have to make a speech. Okay. We can start. <laughs> we can start. Okay. <laughs> 